what can we expect from an adjunctive uh, therapy? So, uh, first of all, I have to emphasize the fact that it has to be adjunct, not as a monotherapy. Uh, it is important that it will, it will show clinical improvement. Uh, we lead to predictable results in high susceptible patient, help long-term stability for the dentition, and change the microbial balance and will help us with resolution of inflammation. So what about systemic antibiotics? The rationale is uh, obvious to eradicate peripathogen and changing the biofilm uh, balance. Systemic antibiotics were very popular in addition to conventional treatment. And in a systemic review that was published just now in 2020s, it was found that the combination of amoxicycline and metronidazole leads to uh, an extra reduction in probing depth of uh, uh, 0.6 in moderate pocket and 1.2 in deep pockets, and elevate clinical attachment level of about uh, 0.3, a uh, pocket closure of about 14%, per, uh, percent, and uh, the follow-up period was uh, for one year. But the combination had also a large uh, uh, incident of side effects. Also, uh, they found that the use of metronidazole alone or azithromycin alone uh, had a significant impact, but had less magnitude uh, than amoxicycline. Okay? We can also see that uh, it was beneficial dramatically in diabetic uh, patient, we see that the difference uh, between a regular patient and a diabetic patient was real dramatic in uh, the reduction of uh, probing depth. And we can see that it also very beneficial for people younger than 55 years that has at least a third of uh, the sites in their mouth with five millimeters or more. Uh, so why not always use it? This is the question. So the answer is resistance. So this is an example uh, for an experiment from Harvard University that show a very, very large Petri dish that uh, if we see bacteria on the sides and then we immerse with antibiotics, in a rising concentration. Uh, you can see that if we see the bacteria on the side of the Petri dish, it takes the bacteria only a few days to create resistant strains. You can see it happens very, very quickly. The bacteria is uh, very smart. Uh, I just want to, to note that uh, these concentration are the concentration that we give in the clinic. All the other concentrations are very, very high and uh, we cannot give them to a real human being. And you can see that it takes only a few days, actually the whole Petri dish was full with bacteria, only in 11 days, um, to fill with resistant strains. Uh, the WHO marked resistance uh, of bacteria as the most pressing issue in the world health. And it predicts that by 2050, 10 million people will die from it. We now just experience a real pandemic, so we know what it's like when people are dying from a disease. So uh, it is smart to be very cautious when uh, we're using antibiotics and to be uh, responsible. And as a part of the medical uh, community, we have a responsibility not to overuse antibiotics and to use it very carefully, only when we positively sure that the patient will benefit from it. And we can summarize that the uh, patients that can benefit from it are patients that uh, have periodontitis grade C, 
patients that are uh, younger than 55 years with uh, more than a third of the sites uh, in their mouth are uh, deeper than 5 millimeters or has a systemic condition like diabetics and smoking that we know that uh, if they will need surgery, they will heal badly. So uh, uh, why not use uh, local antimicrobials instead? Uh, so mainly we have two groups uh, of antimicrobials, but first we will see what can we expect from a local antimicrobial. Uh, it should be safe with minimal side effect. It should be scientifically proven, of course, with local high concentration. Uh, we hope that it will change the microbial balance and we hope that it will have a proven uh, slow release. And it is very important that it will not uh, create resistant strains of uh, bacteria. Mainly we have two groups of antimicrobials. We have the local antibiotics and the local antiseptics. And um, these are the commercial uh, products uh, that are in use. And it was found that uh, they had a small advantage in probing depth and uh, in cal gain. And then there is a very, very large uh, variability and heterogeneity between these products because they have, it's very, very difficult to compare them. And uh, still it is debatable whether they have clinical relevance, but in have, every country you have uh, another uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, product that uh, it is wise to go into this uh, article and to check the data of every one of them and uh, to think whether it's wise or not wise to use them. It is also important that for these uh, products no significant probing depth or color change uh, was found. And now I want to share with you a case from my clinic. This is a young woman that came to my practice with a complaint about her upper right canine. You can see that it has a very, very uh, large bony defect and uh, she was very worried about it. I started with non-surgical uh, periodontal treatment and decided to use chlorhexidine chip in this area to maximize the healing potential. Although I believe that uh, I will perform a regenerative surgery later on, but uh, to my surprise, this was the situation uh, in the beginning of the treatment, and this was the situation after re-evaluation of four months. And uh, she continued to maintain uh, her, to keep her maintenance uh, appointment very, very carefully, and we can see that uh, the results are very, very stable. I have a follow-up of four years now, and you can see that she keeps her canine very well and the other uh, teeth as well. Uh, and this is really a success because we avoided having a surgery here uh, uh, when I was sure that it will be very, very necessary. So when can, when can we think uh, combining uh, anti uh, local antimicrobials? I think it will be wise to use it in a very in very deep pockets or in medically compromised patients that we want to avoid from having surgeries with them. Um, sometimes we have post-surgical residual pockets and we don't want to uh, to to operate again, so we can use uh, antimicrobials in this stage. And also, if we have isolated new bleeding pockets during a supportive treatment, it is wide, wise uh, to use these uh, products in order to maintain the dentitions. So we will move on to lasers. Uh, lasers are very trendy and they have a vast use in dental clinic. 
uh, and maybe we can use this energy to help us change the microbial balance. Uh, we have lasers, uh, all kinds of them, and the most popular in periodontal uh, clinics is the diode. And we also have the photodynamic therapy uh, that includes injecting color material that are absorbed by the bacteria. And the laser energy creates free radicals that cause uh, the death of these bacteria. Um, Although, although there is a biological rationale for using lasers uh, and uh, photodynamic therapy in a non-surgical uh, periodontal treatment, uh, there is a low number of control studies and a very large heterogeneity uh, in study designs. So uh, it is hard to say that uh, there is a proof that they uh, do help us uh, uh, reduce probing depth or creating clinical uh, attachment level, there is a positive antimicrobial effect, but the results are uh, not uh, consistent. So we can summarize that uh, during this phase, uh, this is not a magic wand, and uh, I'm sure that there will be some advantages with this, uh, uh, with this instrument and the uh, some de development in this field. Um, so we will move to replacement therapy and uh, usually when we talk about replacement therapy we mean using probiotics. Probiotics are also very trendy now and, um, and not only in dentistry and uh, probiotics is actually creating new conditions by introducing uh, beneficial bacteria after anti-infective therapy that will inhabit the niches instead of harmful bacteria. Uh, in a research that aimed to examine the benefit in using probiotics for preventing the need for surgery, we can see that in this trial, uh, there is more than 50% reduction for the need for surgeries when using this adjunct therapy. Uh, it is uh, important to know that uh, in this kind of treatment, you completely count on your patient compliance, and for a long period of time, it can be problematic because if you stop using the probiotics, the bacterial balance goes back to the way it used to be before. We all know that periodontitis is an infectious disease and uh, the infectious disease activates the immune system and creates cytokine burst. Uh, we know the, uh, the phrase cytokine burst now very well because of the COVID-19. And like in the uh, COVID-19, uh, the situation and the deterioration from the reaction is actually from the reaction of uh, our body to this infection. Uh, and in uh, periodontitis, it creates the destruction of the attachment apparatus and the bone loss. Uh, if we focused right now only on uh, the bacteria and how to prevent and to lower the count of the bacteria, uh, maybe it is wise that we can uh, focus also uh, on the immune response, trying to block it or diminish the, the, its, uh, its effect. And um, now we have several options, uh, but I will discuss only two of them, uh, the statins and the low-dose uh, tetracycline. So low-dose tetracycline are uh, functioning as sub in sub-microbial uh, doses, which means they do not kill bacteria, but they do inhibit uh, MMPs, and uh, that's how they prevent from the destruction of the soft tissue. Uh, the use of them are proven to be effective as adjunct to non-surgical periodontal treatment 
as you can see, a very, a very, very clear effect in the severe periodontitis patient with the pockets. And these are uh, probably patients that uh, will have surgery and we can see that the effect of the problem debt reduction is very dramatic uh, by using uh, this product. Unfortunately, this drug is not available in every country today. It used to be available in Israel and for many years it's not. Uh, but if you have it in your country, it is why to use it uh, if you can. Another, another promising uh, uh, use is the use of stat statins. Uh, statin, in addition to their main contribution in lipid reductions, uh, has the ability to modify immune system and bone modulation. In a research with bone infrabony defect and a vocation class 2, uh, they injected the subgingivally a gel that was uh, in the concentration of 1.2%. And uh, it showed that it has a probing the production of uh, almost uh, 2.25 millimeters in deep pocket and uh, a gain of clinical attachment level also uh, with 2 millimeters. And uh, it is very, very impressive, but uh, this uh, material is uh, now in a research phase only, and it is not available for clinical use. But as you can see, it was very effective in forcation uh, class 2, which are uh, very, very uh, hard to treat when we're trying to do it uh, non-surgically. So this is very uh, promising. Uh, but uh, we'll have to see what will be later on with this in the market. Uh, to conclude, I personally believe that the non-surgical periodontal treatment should be done with a vision of minimal approaches. This is also my vision as a clinician, and it is very important that our modalities will be scientifically proven and it is important that we will choose for every patient the right treatment plan for successfully periodontal treatment. I want to thank every one of you. And uh, now we can go to the Q&A.